In the two Sundays that I was on my study leave, I got to do something that I rarely get to do, which is to go to other churches. Yes, I love you UCP and I love Unitarian Universalism, but sometimes it is good, especially as a minister, to go see something totally different, explore other ways to do things, and maybe even learn to appreciate what you have even more. The first Sunday, I went to see a friend preach at her United Church of Christ church. The UCC are very progressive Christians. I kind of have a little theology crush on the UCCs, but they still draw their message from Bible passages, a different passage each week. My friend did an amazing job of taking the Bible passage and drawing threads to disability theology, immigration rights, and honoring the most marginalized in our community. The second Sunday, last Sunday, I got a double header in. I went to the 9 a.m. service of an evangelical megachurch. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was interesting. It, actually, I really enjoyed it. I don't need to go all the time, so it was, it was really good. I've never been to a megachurch. How many of you have been have had mega churches in your history. Yeah, so I was with about 2,000 people in a very full arena, I mean sanctuary, I meant sanctuary, sure. Um, I saw a full concert with lights and multiple cameramen and like they had the cameras on the zoom things that go around the top over your heads, like it was super cool. A six piece band and more men in man buns than I have ever seen on one stage before. Um, and then I actually got a really decent breakdown of a Bible passage from the minister. Like, theologically, I thought it was actually really good. It was not at all the theology that I believe in, but I see why a church like this is such an easy choice for so many. There were kids' programs, there were buildings, there were climbing gyms, to be clear, around everywhere. And I could see the draw for folks who were looking for something that fit with a biblical uh, scholar piece, you know, a biblical focus. And it made me very glad that we exist. And then I went to one of our AME churches in town. African Methodist Episcopalian Church is often referred to as the Black Church, and I have to admit that when I have a Sunday free, I love going to a good AME service when I get a chance. They had a small but very committed choir, and it was impossible not to clap with the songs. There was calling out and encouraging of the minister, and the congregation was well, it was clear that they were all family. One of the things that I love about AME services is how approachable they are. Let's be honest, most white Protestant Jewish and Catholic services and UUs come from a Protestant history have certain, even if unstated, rules ingrained in them. You stay seated during the service. You don't talk when the minister is talking. You certainly don't speak back to the minister when the minister is speaking. Oh, yeah. Yes, we're breaking the rules. This is kind of the point. There is also like you don't just get up and wander in the middle of it and go talk to your friends, right? Well, all of those rules don't exist in AME churches and it's divine. Like it is wonderful. There are people moving around and chatting with each other during the service. Everyone was watching each other's kids and the kids knew that they were home. And the minister was having a conversation with the people back and forth. She was saying words and the congregation was saying words back at her. Now again, the theology may not be the same as mine although it was not as far away from mine as the megachurch was. But boy, I left with my soul filled. And if that wasn't enough, the congregants insisted I stayed after because the pastor was barbecuing chicken out in the parking lot and they had brought food for a potluck. So my soul and my stomach were filled. 
It was a contrast of the morning. The first service, so much people, so much energy, very produced, very polished. The second service felt very human. Now, some of you may remember my very first sermon with you all. Yeah, thank you. See, this is good. I encourage this. Speak out. It's okay. We can do this, mostly white people. It's okay. We can do this. We can do this. But yeah, preach it. That first sermon three years ago, can you believe it's been three years? It was called Let's Human Together. Yes, I took a noun and I turned it into a verb, breaking again a lot of rules. We human together. We are humaning. I've heard many of you say back to me the last three years, look at us humaning together. Especially during the pandemic, we very much humaned together, didn't we? Didn't we? Yeah. You're learning, you're learning. Especially related to technology, there was a lot of humaning. There was a lot of reinventing. There was a lot of trying things, making things up, make, figuring out what didn't work. We humaned the heck out of that pandemic. And who knew that those words that I said three years ago were going to be so prescient, prophetic even. So as we kick off this program year, I want to come back and say, we need to remember that we're still humaning together. Yes. yes. In fact, I am encouraging you to level up your humaning. I have a couple reasons for this. Unlike three years ago, all, while our, our community is and our world has been hard, the last several years we have all been through a collective trauma. We have been isolated. We have profound grief. We have lost faith in systems that should have kept us safe. And on top of all of that, many of us have had individual traumas in addition. When we go through our interactions with the assumption that someone that you're interacting with has had trauma, we call that trauma-informed. There's trauma-informed worship, there's trauma-informed therapy, there's trauma-informed leadership. I think that we should just be assuming that whoever we're talking with has been through trauma the last few years. I encourage you all to assume that whoever you're talking with needs to be held with care as if they have gone through trauma and that you don't know the depth to which that has happened to them. Be more clear than you otherwise would have been. Extend more grace and empathy than you otherwise might. The idea that we have no idea what another person has gone through has never been more true. Above all, be kind. Be kind. Two, how many else are still trying to remember how to people again? Anyone going, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to interact with you. Okay, and I used to do this all day, and now that makes me exhausted. Anyone else, like, having just, like, basic peopling challenge? Yes. Yeah, I turned a noun into a verb again. See what I did there? But how many of you, and how many of you felt like your personal interaction skills have taken a step backwards? <laughs> I have. I am more tired after peopling than I was before, and sometimes I feel like I've just lost the ability to make small talk. Like I just, like, oh, I, I, we talk a lot about the weather. I don't know, like, what am I supposed to do? How do I, how do we do this? I can go deep really fast, but that's small talk. I'm still trying to figure it out. Let's also assume that we've all forgotten how to people a little bit and help each other find connections 
If someone's awkward around you, don't assume that they don't like you. Their brains may not work the same as you, they may not people the same as you, and they might have already had a 20-minute conversation that had them exhausted, right? <laughs> Amen. Amen. Smiles don't hurt either. Three, we are remembering how to do things again. I want to publicly give a big shout out to our ushers and greeters right now. They are now called our welcoming team, covering a wide range of things. These folks came back to help us invent outside worship first, and then inside worship with new rules, and then inside worship with more different rules, and have kept adjusting all along. In addition, they help to keep us safe with some, I have to say, just weird events that have been happening the last five months with other kind of peopling. And sometimes they're just trying to figure out how it is that we used to do things. From counting the attendance to using the walkie-talkies, we're relearning how to do church and community and logistics all over again. They are the perfect metaphor for us remembering how to church. See, I did it again, right? We're going to have to continue. We will have those kinds of breakdowns, and we will all need to be patient as we remember, or in many cases, learn how to create it all over again. So I'm back to Unitarian Universalism after two weeks, and it feels so good. And one of the reasons why is that I love knowing that we promote that we've all got inherent worth and dignity. We do not come from a place of sin. We are not inherent sinners. We believe that we were born with inherent beauty, dignity, and worth. Whew. Right? And what's great in the humaning category is that that means that I can screw up and I am still good. I can screw up again and again and again and I still have beauty and worth and dignity. I did. Now here are some words that I said to you in that first sermon in 2019 in the before times, forever ago, a decade ago. I think we need to create a pact between us to screw up and to acknowledge that when we do and apologize if necessary and then move on to possibly screw up again very soon. Because we are human and we're going to do this human thing together. Messing up means we are trying new things. Messing up means that we've taken risks that we're not sure will work. Messing up means that we've possibly taken a leadership role that is new to us. Messing up means that we will most likely have learned something and will grow. Let's human together. So the, the UUA has this document that they give to ministers when they're starting out and it's outlining what the first years of ministry look like. Uh, it's adorable. <laughs> but I'm gonna give you some of the highlights of it and every congregation is different and every ministry is different, but I think you might, I don't even know if I'm supposed to share this with you, but here I'm gonna. So year one is called, where are my keys? <laughs> It's about figuring out all the things, how they work, where's the keys, what do you do, who are the people, that's all of year one. Year two is called extending the honeymoon. Now that you understand the little place a little bit, you can start experimenting. Year three is called hitting your stride, as it is the time when trust is more established and you can start feeling comfortable in proposing things and responding to things. Well, we have finished three years together, and we had a very short honeymoon. And then we had to shut everything down. 
I don't actually think the second year was extending our honeymoon. We went right into figuring out what our stride needed to be as we were totally making up new ministry together. And in year three, when we were supposed to be in hitting our stride, we had four entirely different ways of doing worship last year. So what does year four offer us together? Well, I don't know. We're making this up. This is totally uncharted territory, right? The roadmap has been thrown out, and we are making it up together. The staff and I have put together goals of building trust, creating stability, and encouraging engagement in all the ways. Of all of these, I think trust is the most important. I think it's really important that we take seriously the commitment that we're making to each other on the installation on September 17th. This installation was planned, like totally planned, for March 21st, 2020. Do you all remember that? <laughs> Guess what? <laughs> that didn't happen. But I think it's really touching that we're doing it now because we're not doing it new in the ministry. We've done it. We're doing it while we've already been through some bumps and bruises and reinventing together. It is delayed, but it is still important that we affirm our covenant together. It is a critical step in building our trust. And as we build that trust, you can be more and more confident that I will be here for you in your difficult times. And I'll be confident that you'll be humaning with me when I stumble. And together, we are practicing how to be in the world together because the whole world is humaning. And honestly, it ain't doing a great job of humaning right now. I think we can do better than the rest of the country and the rest of the world. It's a low bar. Let me close with my words again from 2019 with a few amendments for 2022. Let me cast a vision. We try new things, and a good amount of the time we get it right. And let's say, you know, 20% of the time we don't. Oh, let's live on the edge and say even a third of the time we don't get it right. And when we don't get it right, we acknowledge it. We apologize if we need to, and then we get congratulated by others in our community for trying something and it not working, and congratulated even more when it fails spectacularly. <laughs> and we articulate what we learned and how we may try it differently the next time. And our growth is affirmed and celebrated, and therefore our trust and our love grows. And instead of being seen as good for getting everything right, we are seen as being good and worthy and beautiful for trying and failing because that is what humaning is all about. Can you imagine that? Can you? Can you imagine what that culture could do for our children, for our social justice initiatives, for our businesses, for our government. So my beloveds, my dear ones, my hearts, let's human together. Let's take risks, let's make mistakes, let's return back to each other and share what we have learned. Let's acknowledge our imperfections, let's actively love each other, be patient, with each other and proactively forgive each other for doing what we can because we know that all of this makes us all the more human. So might it be. Amen. Amen. Amen.